One billion years in the future, Earth still exists, though maybe not as we imagine it. Eras upon bygone eras worth of technology have been left behind by eight previous and fallen civilizations. It is now up to the denizens of the Ninth World to piece together what was left behind. Perhaps they're looking to carve out their place in the world, or simply to survive a land riddled with weird and unearthly dangers. Or perhaps still, they just wish to learn and uncover the secrets of the Numenera. Whatever it is this new era of adventurers and heroes is looking to discover, they'll have to dig through the imprinted echoes of the past to find it. Hello, and welcome to Imprinted Echoes, a family-friendly Numenera actual play podcast. I'm Zan, and I'll be your GM. Thanks for joining us today. As always, we hope you're staying safe and healthy. There is a very strange sight on the horizon, and our travelers take a pit stop on their journey to investigate what's happening. Customs are learned, friends are startled, and stories are told. Join us as Nehemiah, Smallrin, and Jory pass along their own echoes. You all see something incredibly strange on the horizon. You see a nine-foot-tall toddler. This just took a turn. (laughs) Beg pardon? (laughs) A nine-foot-tall human toddler. On the horizon. Um, well, yeah. Like, not, not like... (laughs) It's, it's... (laughs) Okay. No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, little... I'm just questioning like what's next to it that makes us realize it's nine feet exactly. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> There's a tree next to it. A nine foot tree. <laughs> oh my god. The things I didn't think I was gonna have to be specific about. You see a very tall, taller than normal. <laughs> Toddler. Are we talking human like toddler. a one and a half year old, three year old? That's different. Bridget? <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Everyone roll me a D6. Okay. <laughs> I am here to cause mischief. I don't know what you guys expected. That will be a six. One. Two. Small Rin, you see a three-year-old. Jory, you see a one-year-old. And Nehemiah, you see a, like, one-and-a-half-year-old. All right. Huh. So. Molly also kind of goes, um, everyone else seen the baby? That's, That's a big baby. That's not a baby. Describe okay. that as more of a. What's the word? Toddler? Confusing. I'm not very good with children's ages, to be fair. (laughs) Can you imagine Smallrin as a parent? (laughs) I'm just picturing, like, some less fabulous version of, like, the the short where uh, Edna Mode babysits Jack-Jack. Do we... Leave it alone? Or does it need help? Does it appear to be in distress? Like, is it crying? Is it on, is it walking? Is it toddling currently? Or is it just <laughs> chilling toddling. in a diaper? Is it naked? <laughs> <laughs> I have questions! <laughs> it's clothed. It's crying. Oh. That's what it's doing. It's crying. Is it... Can we hear it? Yes. Is it a babyish cry? No. It's like a, an adult human cry? No, it kind of sounds like... Arr! Okay, thanks. I hate it. So it, it sounds like a dish disposal? Yep. <laughs> cool. A toddler slash baby who is larger than any of us and sounding oddly monstrous just appeared on the horizon. Is anything about this familiar at all? Does it look like anyone we know? No. (laughs) Smallrin. No, No, this is all Bridget. (laughs) Okay, no, Bridget. (laughs) Everyone can roll me either a 
like history based check or a nature or like understanding animals perception at all or this is purely like accessing personal knowledge this is purely have you heard of this before gotcha. i do succeed with an eight okay mm, failure with a seven okay failure with a one gm intrusion oh <laughs> it is me after all <laughs> Oh. It is. I don't think there's much of an intrusion. No, there is. <laughs> oh, okay. The real toddler was the Nehemiah we met along the way. Ah. <laughs> oh. Jory, you... It takes you aback for a moment, and you're like, what in the ever-living heck is that? And then it clicks, first of all, that this is probably an illusion of some sort mm. and you remember that there's something called an ichthalage which are large scaly omnivorous herd beasts that when threatened create a telepathic projection of a immature version of any creature's own species I see so it's um defending itself by pretending to be something that its opponent can empathize with and leave alone. Correct. Or try to the say. problem is, is that it can't change its size. So it being a nine foot tall creature, it makes itself look like a nine foot tall baby. Insert whatever creature you are seeing. That's both horrifying oh and adorable my. at the same time. I, you also I know, yes. do hate that. You also know that these creatures are almost exclusively used by a nomadic peoples called the Ixom. They aren't abhumans, and they aren't human. Kind of possibly someone, some kind of creature that came here long ago, or was created here long ago, that origins now fail to describe, but they are sentient and they are known as a peaceful nomadic storytelling race. Cool. Oh. Hey, I know what this is. And as you say that, and of course the automatons also look over oh, uh, no. to see this, they don't say anything to you or to each other, but they immediately, the three of them, form up into like a triangle formation and start running Stop. towards that. Stop. Like just sprinting. And that is the GM intrusion, that they are sprinting towards whatever they perceive in this moment. Uh, that's probably not a threat. Stop. Uh. They do not. No. I will click, quickly mount up and try and run yep. after them. It's like, what are you doing? Yeah, no. It ain't hurting us. Following on at a gallop. <laughs> yep, yep. You guys all gallop along. You are able to catch up and kind of like riding alongside. You ask that Nehemiah and the leader at the point of this kind of triangle spear tip says Sort of our own. Younger. Distressed. Ah. Oh, uh, it, it's not. Um, it, it's not. It, it's an illusion. Uh, a, a defensive illusion by a, a probable peaceful entity. Roll, roll persuasion. Difficulty... That is uh, difficulty four. Difficulty four, and I, I'm untrained. I can't think of anything that I would... Success with a nine, actually. Nine. Yeah. Oh, you applied effort? Yes. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. No, it's okay. I just want to make sure. Make sure. There we go. Yeah, so y you say that, and the, the leader kind of, like, holds a hand up, and they slow to a jog. Yep. What do you mean, illusion? Uh, it is a, a, a beast of sorts. That when it is scared or threatened, it turns itself into something that the that that will the, its its aggressor will empathize with and therefore leave it alone. We see something different than you. We see one of our young. In Except it's like nine feet tall, and that yes. is. I do want to point this out. Very strange. Yes. Do you also see the size? disparity because that's the giveaway that means it's not real the size is out of the ordinary but not unheard of ah that's interesting to know but um yes it is not 
much thinking. Hmm. We will continue to investigate, but on a less aggressive tone. They yeah, like stow, they're stow their weapons, but they continue jogging towards it. Okay, maybe slow your roll just like 5%. We, we can strut up to these things. We, we, don't, we don't need to jog. Efficiency is the key. <laughs> this is an efficient pace. Yes, but if you are... If you are looking to gain information and not provoke any sort of confrontation without need, then perhaps efficiency could be sacrificed for the sake of caution. Yes. Persuasion. No, I'm not going to use intense inter interaction yet. <laughs> uh, this is a level four still. Yep. I'm going to spend that effort success with a 16 okay the leader holds up a hand again and everyone kind of screeches to a halt your knee and kind of run forward <laughs> a little bit before you realize that they have come to a stop the leader nods and they continue walking huh. forward at this point you get the, the sense that nothing is going to keep them from advancing mm -hmm. but you at least slowed them lovely Ooh, time to meet some new people, I guess. I thought this was just an illusion, a uh, creature. It is, but um, it's often kept... Uh, it's called an Iktalage, by the way, uh, and it's kept by um, the Iksan people, or, or beings, or something. I think they're generally relatively peaceful, so we don't have anything really to do. Yeah, unless, well, I mean, we are with kind of unpredictable fellows, so. I think we just give it its space, probably. And... Yes, but I think we're kind of going to be forced to engage with it and its um, caretakers because our friends do not seem to want to drop. <sighs> and, uh... Uh, have they gone ahead of us sufficiently? Mm -hmm. If they decide to engage, mm -hmm. let's leave. Uh, yeah. I think that sounds like a good idea, honestly. They may rejoin us if they would like. We're not here to start No, fights. we're not, but, but we're kind of responsible for these things now. What if they start hurting are us? We, though? No, but I, look. We are doing everything we can to make sure that they don't do whatever it is they're about to do. And I'm going to go ahead and go out on a limb and say that that stops with us defending them while they attack innocent folk. I ain't gonna help them. I also ain't gonna go against them. We told them, we gave them our word that we'd help them out, yeah. but if they're gonna violate that, you know, very, very small thing of, hey, maybe don't go attacking folk, that's on them. <sighs> okay. Let's get going. You can catch up with them. Your Neen are a little bit faster than them at a running pace, so at a walking pace, mm -hmm. you can easily catch back up. Actually, here's a question. Jory, did you tell Blue to come with you? Uh, I'd assume he'd be following me, yeah. But I'll make sure to, to like tell him to be calm. Okay. And did anyone grab molly on their anine that was what i was gonna ask how is molly traveling <laughs> <laughs> just way behind us <laughs> i figured molly was like hopping between our anine yeah, That's what okay. I, yeah. no in terms of yeah. just regular travel yeah. he's been the anine are big enough to have two people on them that's not a problem but in this moment did anyone grab him or is he jogging behind you i mean realistically <laughs> he might be jogging uh, we, we probably mounted up and just bolted yeah we probably yeah, did that's fair so eventually he catches up. Okay. I feel like maybe one of us should circle back. Okay. <laughs> Someone want to explain the baby? <laughs> no. <Nope. laughs> Jory, this is all you. It's more fun this way, and I'll pull him up. I will, I will. I explain the baby. You pull Molly up onto one of the anine, give him the explanation of what it is you're seeing. And along with the automatons that you've caught up with, start approaching this area as you approach you see three things a herd of ichthalage kind of dinosaur-esque looking creatures 
six legs with a small hump near its first set of, of legs on its back, little ridged hump, uh, with a kind of beluga whale-esque looking round melanous head, a blue-green scaly color to it. I want to ride it. They are mounts, and you see a group of what you assume are the Ixom. Huh. They are lizard fish. More people. reptilian than yeah. fish. I was going to say, they, they, they look like um, They look like very skinny turtles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 They do. With a turtle with like a, a hard frill yeah. mohawk going down the back there. Very, very slender, skinny body as opposed to a shell. Yeah, they are very scaly. They have that same mottled blue-gray pattern to them. You notice that not any single one has the same patterning. It seems to be very individual to each of them, very much like a thumbprint. And the... Despite having these, like, scales and and claws and long limbs, very, like I said, reptilian or, or lizard-like, they are wearing clothes and seem to be incredibly active, probably warm-blooded, regardless of their reptilian nature. There are three or four of them are crowded around what you see as this child, feasibly trying to calm it down, while the others have kind of grouped the rest of the Iqbalaj away in this encampment that they have here. The encampment is not a one night we're traveling and going to pack up the next day. They are nomadic, but it usually seems like they set up in one area for a week or so, do some hunting and gathering, see who comes across their path, and then continue along their pathway within their territory. As you approach, uh, one of them with a large-looking staff notices you and turns and starts walking towards you. Do you approach, or do you let the automatons make first contact? I think as soon we should you know, do that. Nehemiah's gonna go yeah. and take this one. Yeah, <laughs> our silver-tongued buddy over here. Yep. Yeah. That's what I do. You meet partway, mm-hmm. and the Ixom raises its staff and then sets it back down the ground as a greeting of sorts. It says, Welcome. How is it I can help you, travelers? Honestly, just saw your uh, large friend over there, and um, some of our uh, companions became a little more curious. I wanted to get a closer look at what was going on. At the word companions, it looks over at the automatons and Mm kind of gives you a sideways glance about that, but doesn't say anything immediately. It... It's a long story. We revel in stories. Perhaps you can share one. Would you like to stay for a meal, assuming you are peaceable? Of course. You know what? I can hardly hear a word you're saying. Will you knock it off, you big baby? <laughs> <laughs> you will have to excuse our creature's behavior. It was spooked. That's okay. What happened? What did happen? I, I don't... S- what around here could have could have gotten it so startled like that? A terror bird. A what? Ooh. A terror bird. <sighs> that sounds ominous. Quite. What time is it? Approaching dinner. At this point, you guys Approaching had been dinner. like camping. You found the Griffalo and camped out. We're kind yeah. of prepping for for that. Sure. Yeah, we can. Um, let me uh, run back to our old. We are actually just camped over the ridge line there. Let me. Uh, we got some bounty we could probably share with you tonight. That would be wonderful. Please, take your time. Name's Nehemiah. Uh, you are? Ophos. Ophos. Pleasure. I'm Jory. Pleasure to meet you. Jory. Smallrin. Smallrin. Uh, Molly. I will round back up onto the automatons, let them know what's going on, let them know we'll be camping here, and then I will go back and get our remaining Griffalo. Okay. They're not going to introduce themselves because they don't have names, but I'm sure they're pleased to meet you. We should have a conversation about your companions. Ah. You seem to know them in some fashion, or at least their type. 
allow us to sit down and share stories first. Sure. Good plan. Thank you. Nehemiah rounds up the the camp and the supplies that you guys had, brings them all back. The Ixam have prepared a meal of various edible plants and things. A little bit of meat. You're not 100% sure what kind, but it seems edible. But honestly, the main part of their diet is eggs. Large eggs. Is this um, Ixalage egg? It is. Ah, neat. You are told that each one lays two eggs a day, and that almost primarily sustains their people as they travel. Oh, that's actually that's very cool. Yeah, that is incredibly efficient and awesome. You also notice that the Ixam have very little in the way of weaponry. They have tools. They have Numenera, the way that you guys carry ciphers and things like that. They have devices in their their knives and utensils but no swords or staves or bows or anything like that. They seem incredibly peaceful. You said you had a long story. Right. So. And I will say as the GM, you do not have to give the entire thing. I was going to say, you're not going to make me no. recount all of imprinted echoes up to this no. point. <laughs> Nehemiah begins, I was born a very small child. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for the story of what Nehemiah says uh, everybody just go ahead and re-listen to every episode of Imprinted Echoes up to this yeah. point pause the episode go back do it all over again yeah. um, well, but maybe we just get listen at like <laughs> well, no, no, when you get, it's, it's like a repeat in music ah, like when you get back to this point keep on, on going right. but this is your this is your kind of like a, your pause rewind let's kind of reflect on how we've gotten mm, here yes uh, the question that we were asking so so much at the beginning of this session: How did we? How get did here? we get here? Um, uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's kind of the gist of it. You know, there's these folk trapped on the other side of. I mean, what we don't know, but we're we're just trying to get them out. They're incredibly noble to be doing so. We're just doing what fo- we hope folk would do for us. It's a good way to live. Personally, I'm only doing it because I know them. Still noble. Is the uh, Ixalage still a baby? <laughs> no. <laughs> By this time, it has. they have calmed it down, and the illusion has subsided, and it now looks like the large dinosaur-esque creature that it would normally be. I like to think that somewhere around Void Friend, they managed to get it back into its original form. <laughs> Certainly by the time we battled the jellyfish thing in the drain. <laughs> Easily. Well, what about y'all? I mean, how? What, what's bringing you out to this very specific corner of nowhere? We often wander the plains of Kataru here. It is the right season for a lot of the things that we hunt and the places that we like to visit. Have you noticed that the sunsets here are incredibly vivid this time of year? Absolutely. Absolutely stunning. It's one of the reasons we stay. I don't blame you. But this is a relatively normal location for us to be around this time. Mm. Telling stories, oral histories, traveling around, learning, really. That sounds really nice. Just this. This settlement, you say, Lagam. Yeah. We will add it to our list of stops. Do so. Seems like a place that we would like to spend a little time and talk to the people there. I think they'd be thrilled. You might want to set up camp a little ways away. The um Ah um, yes. the spear has a has an effect on the wildlife. I have a feeling you're Critters wouldn't be too keen on it, but as long as you stay far enough, as long as they stay far enough away, you'll be fine. And I promise you, they're welcome into company. You'll be uh, well taken care of within the walls. Wahua, especially. Mm. She is one for stories. So about... Companions. You said you found them Mm -hmm. in that structure. 
They're Ugorlian soldiers. The what? I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, Urgolian. Urgolian. Ha. Huh. Um, you seem to be acquainted with these um, sorts of... Yeah, where or what is an Urgolian? They are mechanical men created in eons past. They frequent the plains here. They're usually found in small groups. They continually act out some directive long, long past. Use well-organized tactics to achieve the means to their ends. Mm -hmm. And communicate telepathically. Now that sounds like our friend. Friend is a strong word. It is. I just was being funny. I, I'll be honest. I feel bad for him. We've been in the situation before we arrived there. One of their own got taken out, so we said we uh, we got, and we do. We got a buddy back uh, back at Lagam that might be able to help put it back together. But they don't even know what they're doing. They don't. They've been set on a course, and they don't even know what the destination might look like. They are going until they die find some unknown truth. It's awful. I won't say this very loud, just in case they can hear and get threatened by it. I wonder if there's a way to, you know, take their objective away, so they can um, have free will. If that is a possibility, that is far beyond the magics and sciences that we know. That is a uh... At best, that's a Rufus question. Ah, yes. I don't even think I don't even think that's a Rufus question. We're talking about something that's potent. I will also say, as someone who studied under a nano, but also came into contact with a lot of people that were very, shall we say, goal driven, directive driven. Sure taking away the directive from a being like that can be incredibly dangerous if all that they live for is to obey and you don't give them any orders that's true they can go looking for someone who will or worse they could invent new orders mm. right now Although I'm sure, if I understand from your stories, they are problematic, yeah? But they have not outright attacked you. No. We managed no. to strike a kind of truce. They will go with you for the promise of fixing their own. Yes. And the benefit to doing that is if things go south there have numbers. In exchange for the stories that you have given us, we do have nanos. Would you like us to take a look at this and maybe take this off your plate for you? You think you might be able to get them fixed up? No guarantees, but if you think that these soldiers would be amenable, you might as well take a look. It is worth asking. We're not sure if Rufus would be able to fix their friend. We're just guessing, so the more eyes on the problem. We have no rights with us. Those acquainted with the Numenera, possibly. And um, if, if it works, it, at least it will take the danger away. They, they tend to um, adapt, so they'll look at you as something that's not a threat. go ask uh, where are they like waiting they're kind of just now uh, now that they realized that there isn't a threat that what they saw was in fact an illusion they kind of have taken up the same position they did when you were burying guard impatient gotcha. but waiting kind sure. of a standby mode 
Hey. Um, so, I was talking to the Ixalm, and sounds like they've got some nanos here that might be able to help you out. Might be able to see about putting your friend together. And if they cannot? We'll keep on going. So long as no damage is sustained. I'm certain we can tell them to be careful. You want to give it a shot? Your call. It's your friend. My friend. Your other. A piece of your home. I like. I mean, you're look, not you're wrong. not wrong. No, that's actually. I just didn't know that you were standing <laughs> right behind me, so it was a little weird. <laughs> Yes, I, I, no, it's okay. all this I traveling my... with a hive mind. You just kind of get into the, the vibe uh, of it. You have the same mindset. <laughs> my legs got tired from sitting there. I needed to stretch. <laughs> uh, look, I, I understand. I should have warned you. Nehemiah should have been listening. He should have heard your approach. That... <sighs> Judgy. <laughs> Both very of you. Far from safety. You're also very sneaky when you don't try to be. I'm always trying. Uh, I am not. <laughs> Do you want to try or not? Up to you. We can agree to this. All right. Of us. They are amenable if uh, they do request uh, caution, of course. We probably got one shot at this. Of us nods and makes a motion to a few other individuals, two others come forward and again very similar to the nanos that you know from human settlements kind of adorned in various robes not quite to the point of it being an Aeon priest of any sort. They don't seem to have that same kind of hierarchical structure but having tools and books and ciphers about them Clearly, those who study the Numenera. This is Tell and Vervo. Pleasure. Two of our most learned. They will take a look. It will take them some time. Would you like to spend the night here within our settlement? That would be fantastic, yeah. Oh, um, I meant to ask, um, you were threatened before we arrived. Mm. Oh, yeah, the terror. Do you need assistance with that? What, what's some... Uh... No, we scared it off. Ah, okay. What is a terror bird? Um, a, a terror bird is a... Terrifying bird. It is, It basically, it's a terrifying bird. <laughs> Let me... Oh, that How thing's big bad. big of a terrifying yeah. bird are we talking? <laughs> if it's the picture I found, it's like a rock, but with like a big head yeah. and four <laughs> wings. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, hold on. So the terror bird is, yeah, kind of like a rock. It's got a big, like, curved beak like a bird of prey. But it is, more than anything, it's this screeching doom call that it makes. It creeps along the ground and then unleashes this banshee-like wail, this screech that can actually mechanically freeze you up. If you don't pass a check, you'll not be able to act the next round. And then once it's kind of scared, it it takes off and then starts like dive bombing. So you get the idea that a terror bird snuck up, gave this screech, and spooked the heck out of one of the ichthalage. They're pretty big, too. They're not all that common, but when if they were to like stand up to their full height, they'd be about nine to ten feet tall. Gotcha. But even more commonly, they're they're probably more like seven or eight. And again, they're not. It's not like they they come in flocks oh. anywhere. So totally manageable, seven or eight feet tall. <laughs> we'll also say that a terror bird is a level four creature, so manageable. I do not think the terror bird is here any longer. We were able to scare it off before it could do any more damage than it already had done. Fair enough. Our camp is your camp for the night. Mm. We will keep an eye on the soldiers. 
certainly. Given that we don't necessarily know their directives. Well, for what it's worth, neither do they. That is what worries me, I think. Understandable. Rest, eat, tell and hear stories. And be on your way once you find the time to do so. We'll take a look at this mechanical man. Well, I mean, we can stick here with you until you get this sorted out. Of course. Are there any particular types of stories that you want to hear? Any particular knowledge you're looking for? Any stories are good. Anything that we can add to the books of our minds. But we have stories of the Numenera, stories of Eon's past, stories of the Steadfast are of great note among our children. I think I could manage some of those. I make no promises about my skill as a storyteller, but... And she kind of hefts up her pack and pulls out her mentor's notes, mm -hmm. which, you know, is a lot of research, but also has some, you know, jobs that we pulled and just general information. What story do you tell? Feeling out the room, they don't seem like they would be particularly impressed with uh, tales of extreme... <laughs> thievery and awfulness. So Smallrin kind of pulls out one of the more lighter, more heist-like um, jobs that we did. We were going up against a rival criminal group, basically just kind of going after a difficult prize for pride's sake. So it was a lot of kind of spy versus spy shenanigans. You have Ophos, you have their attention, and others are listening as well, kind of in a in a small group as you guys are eating dinner but after a little while you do notice a couple as they said children kind of come up and like sit around and are listening very keenly to the story because everyone loves a good heist they love a good heist jory you were saying something actually cat question uh there's a term i just wanted to double check uh whether or not we'd heard it before and i was just having a goldfish brain moment which was i think you said the steadfast Something, yeah. something along those? Okay. Do we know what that is and I forgot? Yeah, the Steadfast is the populated area. You guys are in the beyond, which is kind of like the... Ah, okay. The uninhabited... Not uninhabited, but the uncivilized yes. wildlands. The Steadfast is like the government-structured right. countries, city-states. Okay, I just... I wanted to make sure... Any other stories particularly besides the story of your adventure so far? Any personal stories? Not Nehemiah. Uh, I feel like he probably did a bulk, the bulk of the talking during the initial story. Uh, is more than happy to lean back and listen to uh, Small Wren spin her tail, and uh, he will sit like with the children and like hang out with the kids. Tiny nice. turtle-faced children. <laughs> Aww, so cute. <laughs> the kids kind of ga gather around you as well. Um, one of them actually like tries to climb up your back and like grabs onto the handle of your ah, sword spear ah. and like oh, uses okay. it as a trying to like stand on your shoulders and like use it as, as a thing to hold on to i will reach behind and just like pull them up onto my shoulders and just like have a child up on my yep. shoulders for a little while yep and happily sit there listening to the stories um authors yes do you um do you appreciate uh, fantastical stories? Okay, just checking. Want to make sure it didn't have to be true and could be offensive. Uh, I'm going to start telling everybody the adventures of Box Ladder and Blue, <laughs> and it's it's like comic style, odd odd couple adventures. <laughs> Tell me one of the shenanigans that Box Ladder and Blue get into in your story. Box Ladder got stuck once in between a rock and another rock and blue tried to find a way out and it wasn't until um blue gave up um his pride and made friends with some local uh beasts um that offended his uh, sensibilities that he was able to uh, gather everybody behind box ladder and push him out via consolidated strength yes the 
the group listens again and this one's a little more lighthearted, a little more silly. So you get a lot of giggles from the kids and smiles and knowing nods from, from the adults, just, you know. And you guys notice the entire time there is a couple of people who are listening, but very, very actively so. Not just like listening to hear it, but they are listening to memorize. And so as you are telling these stories, they are committing what you are saying to memory so they, they can add it into their own rotation and their oral tradition. That's so That's cool. very cool. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Gotta expand the set out. Mm. Anything else anyone would like to do before the sun sets and you head to bed for the night? probably after a couple of hours like right before going to bed I would check in on the progress of um, the reconstruction the two nanos Tel and Vervo are able to get part of it back together it looks like they have kind of like a torso piece and the neck piece kind of together and they're piecing together the bits and bobs of what might be a head. They're trying to like go from the inside yeah. out. Um, and Tell looks up to you. I think we might be able to have something here probably not complete but perhaps semi-functioning before tomorrow morning. Hey, that'd be great. Just be careful. They're a little touchy. Uh, you know, we're, we'll defend you if something were to happen, but I don't want it to come to that. No, I thank you for your caution. Uh, to be honest, I'm actually rather nervous working on this. I understand. I, I've got full confidence in you. Well, thank you. We'll keep working through the night, and we have time to rest tomorrow, so hopefully we'll have something for you by morning. You want me to sleep here? I was here? about to say, and Smallrun appears out of the darkness. <laughs> appears again! Why do you keep doing because that? Because you react like that. Oh, <laughs> it's fine. I'm just going to die of a heart attack. I mean... Uh, I came along to this <laughs> the show. <laughs> I... Yeah, the real skill was in continuing to be as stealthy as she normally is with Jory with her. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. We're working out a system. Yeah. No, Smallrin small Rin sees this as like an extra test of skill. Um, mm -hmm. I was about to say, I think perhaps it would be a good idea if we took it in turns to sit up with these nanos. Perhaps provide them a little company through the night. Sure. Uh, yeah, Molly can help take a watch on that one too. Of course. Molly walks up. <laughs> Molly see, pops I, I, up I out heard of the grass. Him. I saw <laughs> him walking up. <laughs> Appears in a puff of smoke. Of course, I'd be happy to. And honestly, I wouldn't mind learning a little bit, too. Mm. Like I said, I'm good at usually putting things back together, but this was kind of beyond what I understood. So I'd love you to. You were under a bit more pressure than out here. There's a, quite a different feel when you have a weapon pointed at your back for days on end. Mm. But I'd love to learn if possible. I feel hmm. like when we get back to Lagan, we should get Molly some therapy. <laughs> I think you all need a little bit of that, but that's a different nah. story. <laughs> I mean, that's TTRPGs. If you're oh, not playing yeah. someone yeah, a little bit no. broken, yeah. I mean... I mean... Yeah. You guys set up watches. Molly actually stays up most of the night, actually stays up for a couple of the the shifts just to, like I said, learn and observe mm -hmm. and talk. And throughout the course of each of you getting up and going to sleep, you realize that it really is more keeping them company. This is an incredibly safe settlement, partially because the Ichthalage are kind of testy. And so, like, if the smallest thing, you know, comes in, their defenses go off. Like, you, you hear them kind of, like, make grunts and noises, and every time that happens, 
one of the Ixom somewhere looks up to see what it is. So it seems as though, even though these are very peaceable people, they aren't indefensible. They're simply well protected by these creatures that they keep with them. Does this mean like all throughout the night at random points there's suddenly a crying baby? <laughs> no, not to that extent. Okay. Just the general like grunts and groans of animals. Just curious. <laughs> the night passes without any children. <laughs> yeah. Love this symbiotic relationship the nomadic storytellers and their egg-laying dinosaurs. Cool. It's I like very cool. Lot. I do too. Can we just stay here? Yeah. <laughs> like Nehemiah absolutely had the thought of like, man, this is this is so much better. All right, new plan. Once we get our friends back out of the tumult, we come yes. back here and become wandering, wandering oral historians. <laughs> Perfect. They're going to come back to where we live at some point, and we're just all going to leave with <laughs> yep. them. Pretty much. Not a bad life. Spend your watches. Who has the last one? Who sees the sunrise with these Ixom nanos? I will. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say that since they said the sunrises were... and sunsets i guess we're so spectacular small run gives you guys the option because she doesn't really care that <laughs> okay nehemiah would probably be an early riser in this situation yeah. but he probably also took the first watch so mm, yeah he, he might be waking up but he is not the one that is on watch at the time sure okay i, I can do it yeah the sunrise is spectacular it rises from the east, and as it peaks over the horizon, the rays of sun diffuse through the tall grasses, the various sparse trees, and as the rays just hit the edge of the mountains and the light passes up towards it, the entire plains is cast in this luminescent golden shine. <laughs> As the light then kind of like passes over the encampment, a little bit of glint catches on the bits of metal and pieces that these nanos are working on, and you see that put together is the torso, neck, and head of one of these Orgolian soldiers. Since I am looking, and I notice this, I want to check for something. Mm -hmm. um, based on the pieces that they put together and um, everything else that's flying around, does anything about this one um, seem different from the other three? If no, that's fine. Not particularly. They all do have small differentiations. Not to the extent that more organic um, no. creatures would, but they, they have, like, small differences. They all carry a slightly different weapon. They have slightly, you know, different gaits and, and walking styles, things like that. Nothing, but... nothing indicative of, say, a rank of some kind. Ah. Yes. No, there are no markings or rank designations. Okay. You could ask. I could. I shall. <laughs> <laughs> They're not asleep. No. Boy, look at that sunrise, eh? <laughs> As it happens every day. Yes, but um, it's uh, it's different every day though too, isn't it? Even you must notice that sometimes it's nicer, uh, like it is right now, and then sometimes it's grey and awful out, which is not. In any case, um, I was just curious, um, your friend, um, that's, I'm sorry, you don't know the word friend, you'll get used to it, your friend, who is being put back together is, is, um, are they a different, uh, rank from you? 
are? Are you kind of all the same? I, I'm mostly just curious from a like a, a sociological standpoint. Um, I like to study cultures. I'm kind of curious. Yes, this one was. Rank is a an incorrect word for it, but there's not a better one in this language, I don't think. Ah. A leader, yes. Ah. I was just curious. Um, thanks. Hope it's going well. These creatures have put back more together than this other. As they point to Molly. Ah. Than this other has ever been able to do. Well, good on them, then. Excellent. But your Rufus will need to finish the job. Oh, uh, yes. Why? Uh, is something... We are leaving, are we not? Uh, yeah, yes, I suppose. Um, well, I could check. See. We'll be right back. Okay. I'm gonna go wake the other two. Nehemiah, like, you, you walk over to him and he's like, laying on the ground just watching the sunrise. Oh, hey, you're up, buddy. Hey. hey, what's going on? Um, so I was asking some questions, and um, it, it sounds like the thing that's being put together now is going to be the leader of the four of them. Which is fine, but it made me think if that has different directives and it's activated then maybe bad things could happen depending on what those are because it's suddenly adding a new element into this situation i mean that was always going to be the risk of reactivating one of them true true leader but, or not but yeah but i feel like leader has a more unpredictability about it you see just something to think about yeah. and keep an eye on i don't want to put these people in any more danger than agreed no that's so. why i'm you know trying to stay close to the tent just in yeah. case something does happen. Well, I think, and small run up here. Oh <laughs> See, I saw that one. That was <laughs> <fine>. <laughs> My heart. Okay, they just sit down. Okay. Yeah, okay. now you ben see ben. how you like it. Uh, uh. Small run produces <laughs> a little a little mug of, of steaming hot Ben Bane. Oh, give me a second. <laughs> I'm drinking in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Sets it down. Anyway, as I was saying, I think that perhaps it would be best that we ask these nanos not to complete the work even if they can, and get these get this fellow back to Rufus, where we have allies and numbers should anything go wrong. These are hospitable people, but they are not fighters. No. But at the same time, I don't want to put something on Rufus if they don't if they're not gonna be able to do anything. They're making progress. Real progress. I have a feeling that things are going to go south much faster if something can't be done. And if we go back to Lagam and Rufus can't fix it, well I mean these folks are offering, and if they can put them back together. I mean, we'll see what the uh, links that they're going to be able to do things are ends up being. But if they can do it, I say we go ahead and let them. And we'll see what happens. If they're willing to roll those dice, so am I. Fair enough. I will roll back over. <laughs> <laughs> Small room <laughs> hands you your tea. I will, but before you, before you talk to him, hold on, let me, let me see how it's going. I will say, I will sit with my tea, um, uh, the soldiers are expecting this not to be finished today and are assuming that it will be completed by Rufus, if that assists them at all. We'll see about that. I'll kip up and walk on over to the, uh, to the tent. All right, fellas, how's it going? We're starting to reach the end of, I think, what we're going to be able to do here. Huh. We understand how I think the rest of it is supposed to be put together, but it's, um, there are components that, and tools that we don't have access to. Fair enough. Well, 
Guess our journey will continue then, but we do appreciate this. This is... Hey, it's looking all right. It's starting to actually look like a person. Yeah. Uh, that's the wrong word for it. Well, for lack of better nomenclature, that'll be fine. More to the point, like, more... Closer to person than pile at this point. Yes. All right. Well, we'll be getting out of your frills here in just a little bit then. I'll walk on over to uh, to the automatons and let them know we'll be rolling out in a little bit. And uh, I'll go ahead and start getting breakfast ready. Or snack breakfast to go. A and... couple of breakfast burritos. I was going to say, you're all given omelets. <gasps> oh, delish. Wicked. And you're also, after giving the story about how you, you are a little bit short on rations, you are offered in trade some of the eggs for the griffalo meat. Not all of it, but a... Yeah. Let's have some variation here. If you give us some of that meat, we'll give you some of our eggs, and yes. that way you'll still have enough food. Eggs and griffalo bacon. <laughs> griffalomlets. <laughs> griffalomlets. <laughs> I, no, I like that. Griffalomlets. <laughs> you all pack up your stuff. Is there anything that you want to make sure you take care of before heading out? The soldiers are, again, standing impatiently and ready to go. Molly has all of his stuff packed up, little as it was. If you want to make any more recovery rolls, mm. you easily can. That's Especially the 10-hour one would have happened overnight, so if you want to yeah. work up to that 10-hour one and take that 10-hour one, you can. Yeah, I think I'm going to take the 10-hour the and then the action. An action. I should just need the one. My plus takes care of it, so I'm back mm, to the action. Nice. nice. All right. Everybody ready? I think so. I'll ride past Ophos real quick. Now, you be, you make good on that. You stop by Lagam, all right? We absolutely will. It sounds like a place of phenomenal people. Look forward to seeing you there. Next season, hopefully, we'll be around that way. All right. Awesome. Hold you to it. Don't make me hunt you down. And at that, I will crack the crack my reins and head off yes and uh, I, I make sure that blue hasn't wandered off with you blue has not wandered off blue has stayed pretty close to you okay. taken whatever instructions you've you've given but is like other other than that kind of inactive hmm. which good or bad is a thing a thing yeah I'll keep an eye out just in case he starts behaving weirdly. Molly jumps onto one of your anine with y'all, and the soldiers start into a slow jog alongside, again, roughly keeping up with with you guys. You're, I'm assuming you're not galloping away, but they can they can keep pace. The temptation to gallop away for dramatic effect is there. I feel like Nehemiah especially seems to have done the whole, like, end scene of uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade where they like Marcus Brody just like yeah and races off down the canyon the, the, the temptation is there but he, he doesn't want to leave people in a lurch <laughs> so Nehemiah will, yeah. will will gallop off at a respectable pace and immediate, almost immediately draw rain when you tell the story later, you absolutely galloped off. Well, yeah. Natch. Handful more days pass. You have good rations thanks to what you found and what you traded. You have good company with Molly. Tells you a little bit more about his life growing up in the Steadfast. Him and Gart growing up. What they got into mostly small thievery gangs and eventually kind of working up to more mercenary work and making a pact to always stay together. They changed companies and groups a handful of times, but regardless, they were always side by side with whatever it was that they were working on. Telling those stories seems to help Molly process a little bit more. Process the fact that Gart's actually gone 
there's a new portion of his life that he has to face alone now, which is not something he necessarily expected to have to do so soon. You know, Molly, if you end up hanging around for a while and uh, the uh, the Ixal end up showing up, you should tell him those stories. Seems like a good way for uh, for Garth to keep living on. That's, that's a good idea. I, I didn't quite feel comfortable doing it then. No. I, I didn't... Process. Take your time. That's a, that's a good idea. I think other people knowing... Knowing what we've done together, I... I'd like that. I'd like that a lot. Sometimes legacy is just what people say when we're gone. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So after you guys get back to the GOM, take care of things, uh, we're going to this other place? Seems to be. Can I come with you? Dangerous. All no, I'm afraid that. Definitely dangerous. <laughs> Super yeah. dangerous. I realize we that are, like you're a mercenary, but we but, are one hundred percent certain that we are going to be sucked to a different plane of existence. Yeah, and uh, it's a place called the Tumble, which I'm going to be honest, sounds awful. Is probably not a candy factory. We are selling this, guys. I, I look. No, we are because here's the thing. I've listened to this man talk for the better part of three days now. And he seems to be the kind of guy who wants to get involved in some dangerous things. And has done that before. That being said, this is likely the most dangerous thing that, you know, I know I've probably done. And I have done some dangerous things. And I think that goes the same for you two as well. <laughs> and at that... Nehemiah swerves uh, <laughs> swerves them out. What's one? What is one? <laughs> Honestly, I'll get back to you. Top three is fairly nebulous. I think that just describes you. Hmm. I don't think you're wrong. <laughs> well, you're not wrong, Nehemiah. I, uh, I know I, I've kind of been out of sorts the last couple of days processing things, but um, no, normally I, I like a little bit of danger. And honestly, I've spent so many years working for shins, doing dangerous stuff for the coin that honestly, I think it might feel good to do dangerous stuff to help someone. I completely understand. So, yeah, I think I'd like to come with you to this dangerous plane of existence. All right. Well, we got to take care of this first. Yeah. Yeah, let's do that. And you guys continue on and you eventually see the very short but distinctive skyline of Lagam getting larger in the distance and just over the hill you can see the orb it's changed color um <laughs> it was kind of a whitish light pale blue when you first arrived it changed orange when you ended up um, <laughs> activating some things and the, the walls moved and it is now a Pale lavender, pale purple. Uh, All we, right, <laughs> we did it, um, Reddit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna ride ahead. I'm gonna ride ahead back into town because I need to see, appraise what's going on, and let them know. Hey, it's gonna get real weird here, real quick. Oh yes. Nehemiah, having seen this, you start taking off towards the rest of the city, and in quick succession, the other two of you realize that, oh, things have changed, and also urge your mounts on towards Legam, and you'll have to figure out what's changed next time. Game. Ooh, no. <laughs> yeah. Stop. It's a me ending. I hate it on the other end. 
Thank you so much for listening to episode 43 of Imprinted Echoes. If you want to follow the podcast on social media, you'll find us on Twitter and Facebook at Imprinted Echoes and at our website, imprintedechoes.com. On our website, you can find the links to the Ghostlight Media merch store and our Patreon if you're able to help us out monetarily. And in that vein, I would like to thank Carlin, Roger, and Kyle for their continued support. If you'd like to help support us in other ways, please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast and leave us a rating and review on whatever podcatcher will let you. And if nothing else, tell a friend about our show. You can also find our hosts on Twitter, myself at Covered and Sawdust, Chase at TQ Loudly, Rin at Rin underscore Moran, and Bridget at Really Bridget. And of course, our network, Ghostlight Media at GLM Pods. Thanks once again for listening, and I hope you'll come back in two weeks for another episode of Imprinted Echoes. And until then, may your ciphers never malfunction. Imprinted Echoes is produced by Zan Campbell-Johannes and Chase Greenley, and is edited by Pat Mahood. Original show theme music is by Justin Longacre. This is a Ghostlight Media production.